Hello everyone and welcome to another History and Myths video. Now this one obviously is special because of uh, the date of the upload. Today is the 1st of June uh, 2016. Exactly 100 years ago, the 1st of June 1916, um, the Battle of Jutland ended. The Battle of Jutland actually spanned through two days, um, the 31st of May to the 1st of June 1916. Now the battle itself we are not going to cover, mostly because it's going to be, if I do that, it is going to be mostly a, a collection of this happened and then happened that and that happened there and whatever. I think the implications of Jutland are much more interesting than the battle itself. The battle is very interesting, don't get me wrong, but it's very dry in terms of uh, what really matters. Let's remember that Jutland was the biggest naval engagement ever, at least involving surface ships. Especially so since the uh, beginning of the steam era, since the moment the steam machine became a thing, and especially so in warships, the biggest engagement ever was that one. Obviously, we can argue that the Philippine Sea uh, battle in World War II was bigger in the scope of total warships involved, but it was what regards to a direct surface engagement of two fleets fighting each other, the biggest one was Jutland. Obviously, such a battle of such a scale had a lot, a lot of implications and a lot of consequences, and those are what we are going to see in this video. Now, Jutland is usually thought as a German victory. People say that, um, actually, it's, it's kind of sensible to say so, right? If we take a look at the total losses of the battle, and I'm just going to count material losses here, not loss of life, because <laughs> then things look even worse, are grimmer for the British. The British lost a total of 113,000 tons of warships sunk, which included three battle cruisers, which were indefatigable, Queen Mary and Invincible. Three armored cruisers, which were pretty big ships, uh, even while they were obsolete by the time, which were Black Prince, Warrior and Defense. And finally, they lost eight uh, destroyers. Tipperary, Sark, Sparrowhawk, Turbulent, Ardent, Fortune, Nomad and Nestor. Meanwhile, the German uh, Navy lost a total of 62,000 tons sunk, which included the battle cruiser Lucho, and the pre-dreadnought uh, Pomern, and also four light cruisers, Frauenlob, Elbing, Rostock and Wiesbaden, and uh, five destroyers, uh, B-48, B-S-35, B-27, B-4 and B-29. Now, obviously, if we only look at the relative losses, it's obvious to see that the British got the hardest part of the stick, right? I mean, it's brutal, 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 the difference between uh, the losses of one side of, or and, uh, and the other one, especially in what regards to important ships, because the German lost a battleship, a battleship, they lost Pomern, but Pomern was a totally obsolete warship for the time and totally useless, I mean, it really was useless, and um, meanwhile the British lost three of their bounded and very flamboyant battle cruisers. Obviously, the repercussions of that weren't um, soft. But we are taking a look at the direct losses. Now, we have to understand one thing. In, in a battle, uh, you win if you keep the battlefield. Yeah, you can lose a lot more than the enemy, but if the enemy doesn't control the battlefield at the end of the day, you actually won the day. This is very well represented by many, many, many battles in the Eastern Front of World War II. In that scenario, in that theater of, of operations, the Germans, um, in almost, almost, not all of them, but almost all of the battles involved, uh, they lost less life and less material than the Soviets. But the Soviets won the war. What's important in a battle is who controls the battlefield afterwards. The battlefield in a naval battle is the ocean, the seas. Who was in control of the North Sea after the Battle of Jutland? Well, the British were. The Germans couldn't establish control, they couldn't exploit that, quotes, 
victory because the British Navy was still absolutely superior in numbers to the German one. Yeah, tactically speaking, operationally speaking, the Germans got a pretty significant victory. And um, for a time, really, they, they, they thought they had won a major victory in Jutland. In, re in relative terms, however, in real terms, in, reali in realistic terms, the Germans actually won nothing in Jutland. Because at the end of the day, well, Germany was still under a blockade. Germany couldn't break the blockade. Germany still couldn't challenge the Royal Navy. And uh, Germany still couldn't be, uh, win the naval war. At least not with the surface ships. So the Battle of Jutland actually was a British victory. Believe it or not. It's more, than a it's more of a stalemate than a victory. But even so, it was a strategic victory for the British. Because the German Navy, which had been built with a huge cost in materials, money, and labor hours proved itself unable to beat the Navy it was designed to counter. And um, actually it, it proved that the whole World War I was such a catastrophe for the German um, leadership. Because the only and one reason Britain was in the Entente, in the Triple Entente with uh, France and Russia, was that Germany had thrown the UK into French hands and French arms by trying to compete with the Royal Navy at the sea. Germany and Britain had been allied for centuries, if not as a nation, because Germany as a nation was in existence, in existence only for 40 years um, by the time World War I started. Um, if not in nation, yes, in the precursor states of, um, of Germany, especially Prussia, had been a close ally of uh, Britain for close to two centuries. Especially so during the Seven Year War, where Prussia stood alone in the continent uh, while Britain was engaged in the French in North America. Um, especially, very especially so during the Napoleonic Wars, um, up to the point that Waterloo was won because uh, the Prussian troops of Lutzer were there. Otherwise, Wellington would have never won Waterloo. It was a very long alliance between the German states and Britain, a very long story of friendship. Meanwhile, the story between Britain and France, and France, well, we all know how it went, right? It was constant warfare since the medieval ages until the 19th century. And the only and one reason Britain lined up with France was that Germany was being a serious, serious contender and a serious threat to Britain's most important asset, which was the Royal Navy. How they became such a threat? By embarking themselves in an arms race with the Royal Navy. World War I actually should have never happened had the German leadership shown a little bit of intelligence. Because Germany could have st um, still been allied with the British. Instead, they threw the British into the French hands. Now, this is one of the side <laughs> thoughts and side stories that go with Jutland. Jutland was not only the battle. The battle obviously was very important. It was huge in numbers. There were around 50 battleships involved. There were 15 battlecruisers involved. There were dozens of cruisers. There were dos, almost a hundred of destroyers. The battle was of epic proportions. But even then, <laughs> really, it's more important all the strategic considerations of that battle than the battle itself. Because that battle alone simply the mere fact that the Germans simply couldn't beat the Royal Navy well pretty much underlined and underscored the fact that World War I was a huge mistake. Huge mistake for the Germans. First because they should have never gotten in, in themselves into it and they could have very easily avoided it by the way. And second because <clears throat> they were facing an enemy that should have never been an enemy in the first place. They actually created an enemy on their own. 
For no particularly good reason, let's face it, other than challenging the spot of the most powerful global um, nation of the world, which at the time was uh, the United Kingdom. So yeah, that's one of the interesting things about Jutland. See, <laughs> I told you, it's not just about. Of course, there were a lot of consequences, and there were also a lot of pre consequences. Or actually, Jutland itself was a consequence of a um, series of things and series of facts that happened one behind the another since the war began. Now, as we can see, uh, as we have seen, and as I mentioned to you. The mm, German fleet was much lesser in power than the Royal Navy. In terms, in pure terms, and I'm going to just mention the numbers on the Battle of Jutland. This is not the whole fleet of both nations, but it's a good representation of the relative power of both navies. Okay? In the Battle of Jutland, there were the following ships involved. From the British side, there were 28 battleships. There were nine battle cruisers, there were eight armored cruisers, there were 26 light cruisers, 79 destroyers. Meanwhile, the Germans got into the battle with 16 battleships, six pre dreadnought battleships, five battle cruisers, 11 light cruisers, 61 destroyers. As you can see, this is very close to a 2v1 <laughs> in favor of the British. Tone by tone, and uh, quality wise, the Germans actually had better ships, but the problem is that numbers simply don't lie the British Navy was much, much, much stronger and the Germans couldn't do a, a thing versus them. And um, this, again, this is not the whole fleet. I mean, this wasn't the whole German fleet. This wasn't, wasn't the whole Royal Navy. But it's a good representation of the relative powers of both fleets. What we can see here is obviously that Germ the Germans were hopeless in a straight-up fight versus the Royal Navy. So since, since the beginning of the war, the Germans weren't trying to get that kind of fight. They didn't want a Jutland. They actually wanted something different. What the Germans were waiting for was for the British to do a blockade of their ports. As they got um, the news of the British, um, well, getting into the war, they expected the Royal Navy to do the same that the Royal Navy has done to Napoleon. Uh, to the Russians at Crimea, uh, to the Danis at Copenhagen, they were waiting for the uh, Royal Navy to come close to the German port to blockade them. Obviously, the Germans saw an opportunity there, because with the main um, British battleships close to the German coast, the Germans could send out submarines, they could lay minefields, and hopefully destroy a very important portion of uh, the British battle line. The problem is obviously that the British weren't idiots, <laughs> so that didn't happen. The British did establish a blockade on the Germans, but they didn't come close to their, por their ports. Instead, well, they simply started patrolling all the straits into the North Sea, and, um, well, they blockaded the North Sea itself. They didn't blockade Germany, they blockaded the whole North Sea. So Germany suddenly found that it wasn't going to be that easy to destroy part of the Royal Navy and to equalize both navies in strength. So in a straight-up fight, they could beat the Royal Navy. So now the passive approach didn't work at all. Well, they started doing and taking some active measures. The active measures in particular were more or less... Uh, happened several times, um, operations where the German battle cruisers would dash across the North Sea, arrive to the British East Coast and uh, bomb the heck out of whatever British town they found, and uh, then return and uh, come back to Germany. The idea was to lure part of the British fleet into a fight, not the whole Grand Fleet, but part of it. The idea was for the British to think that it was only the battle cruisers. So they would send their own battle cruisers, the British battle cruisers, and some British battleships to fight off the German battle cruisers. To obviously complete the trap, it's time the German battle cruisers did one of those raids. Actually, the German high seas fleet, the whole 
um, battle fleet sailed behind them. The idea was again to lure the enemy into a trap and to destroy a very good portion of the Royal Navy. So after the battle, with what that part of the Royal Navy destroyed, both fleets were equal in numbers and they could go against the Royal Navy in a straight up fight. Obviously that was wishful thinking. <laughs> That was wishful thinking, and in one of those operations, actually, what happened was that the um, Germans got caught um, off guard and uh, they lost one of their warships, SMS Blucher, which wasn't a battle cruiser, but was an armor cruiser, and uh, the Kaiser got really, really, really pissed off, and uh, summarily and dismissed the commander of the German Navy because of that loss. So obviously the Germans were in a kind of a crossroads. What do we do? We have one, the second most powerful fleet in the world, and we can't use it because if we lose, because the enemy is more powerful than ours, and if we try to do something to lure the enemy into a fight and we happen to lose that fight, well the Kaiser is going to get mad and he's going to sack all of us. So what do we do now? Well, what happened next is that the Germans started, um, well. Realizing that maybe, maybe the surface fleet wasn't a factor and that they should go for something different. Indirect warfare, submarine warfare, using the submarines as mercant raiders. And that was the beginning of the first declared uh, submarine blockade of the United Kingdom. This was the first submarine offensive of history. And it was particularly successful because really the, the, the British, the British went, uh, got caught um, totally cold handed. <laughs> From nine, one day to the next one, they started losing mercant shipping like mad. And not only them, of course, anyone who was uh, sailing, uh, sailing ships to the United Kingdom were losing ships like mad. But the problem was that one of those nations were, happened to be the United States. And particularly so, particularly so, after losing Lusitania and the sinking of Lusitania, the US became quite pissed off and they seriously threatened um, the Germans. They actually sent an ultimatum to stand off the submarine campaign and to, um, well, refrain from attacking neutral shipping without um, previous notice. There were a series of um, naval regulations for raiders back in the time, but obviously those regulations were totally impossible to comply with a submarine uh, because it involved uh, surfacing, boarding the, enemy, the um, suspect intercepted uh, cargo ship, looking at the manifestos to see if actually that cargo was going to the warring nation, etc, etc, etc. The submarine wasn't going to, to do that. Some tried, but the problem is that the Americans started carrying guns. And if you surface in front of Americans with guns, <coughs> things are not going to end that well. Let's, say, let, let's put it that way. So obviously the Germans were again in a crossroads. What do we do now? <laughs> we have a very successful um, weapon, which is the submarine, which is causing a lot of damage to the, uh, to the British, but we can't use it because otherwise the United States will join the war. Well, they stopped it. They stopped it. They really called off the submarine offensive for the time being and they returned the submarine to fleet operations. And one of the reasons why Utland happened was exactly of that and because of that. One of the consequences of Lusitania sinking was that uh, the US sent an ultimatum to Germany, Germany folded to that ultimatum and they called off the submarine offensive. So the German Navy was back to square one. What do we do? We do have a huge fleet, we can't use it. So we keep it at, at, at dock or to what, do, what, what do we do? Jutland actually was yet another of those, um, let's say, lure things, um, lure operations from the German Navy. The idea was to sail with the battle cruisers, intercept shipping in the North Sea, uh, especially from Norway to, to the United Kingdom to attack some mercant shipping there and to attract uh, British battle cruisers and maybe some battle units into a fight with the support of the German Navy and destroy that part of the British um, Royal Navy. The problem is that the British knew that was coming. The British were reading the German code books since the pretty much the beginning of the war. Because in 1914, um, German late cruiser 
SMS Magdeburg uh, had uh, beached itself in very close to, well, actually in Russia. The Russians boarded the beached ship and they found the code books of the um, German Navy still on board. Obviously, that was priceless. They sent some of those books, a copy of those books, to the British, and the British set up was what we call call we could call uh, the World War One version of Bletchley Park, which was well, everyone knows what Bletchley Park was. It was called Room 40. Actually, it wasn't a room. It was a huge, huge establishment of intelligence, which was dedicated to reading the um, German. Uh, naval ciphers. So the British knew something was up. The British knew that uh, the Germans were sailing. The problem is that the British didn't knew that the whole German fleet was sailing. So they sent up um, the whole Royal Navy. <laughs> they thought the Germans were sailing only with the battle cruisers, with a little bit of support from the German Navy, but not from the whole fleet. So they sailed the battle cruiser squadron. Uh, with uh, Admiral Beatty, and they also sailed the whole Grand Fleet. All of it was sent the German way in order to catch the German warships and destroy them. Meanwhile, the Germans were thinking that they were going to catch a part of the Royal Navy. So they were both fools. Jutland was actually a big mess up from both sides, from the German side, because they were trying to set a trap and they got trapped themselves and from the British side because they had the golden opportunity of trapping the German fleet on the on the North Sea but they did, they weren't expecting it to happen so yeah it was quite of a big mess up of it as you can see another very nice approach <laughs> to the battle obviously those are all previous things to the battle itself. The battle itself, again, caused a lot of lo a lot of uh, loss of life, a lot of material destroyed, um, and uh, a lot of, let's call it, um, victory, yells from Germany, and uh, infuriated answers from the British public. Now one has to put everything in perspective. Um, the last big battle of the Royal Navy had been in Trafalgar more than 100 years before. And obviously, the British were living under the constant idea that the Royal Navy would always deliver a Trafalgar each time they would meet an enemy fleet. The problem was that the Royal Navy wasn't as good as they thought it was. The German fleet was a heck of a fleet. It wasn't as big as the Royal Navy, but the commanding officers were top class, the sailors were extremely well trained, the warships were really well built and really well designed. The only problem is that the Royal Navy wasn't expecting that. They still thought themselves as, uh, as the unmappable force, the impossible to beat uh, naval um, fleet. And actually they were close to it, but because of sheer numbers, not because quality. The British lost a lot of men in Jutland. They lost a lot of ships in Jutland. They still won at Jutland. But obviously the British public didn't see that at the beginning. What they saw was the German victory, the tactical victory. The British had lost much more than the Germans in the fight. How could it be? Well, how could it be? It could be, first of all, because of the... We already said that, but we are going to say it again. It happened because the German battle cruisers were much better than the British battle cruisers. The British battle cruiser concept was flawed, and um, the conception of a ship with a lot of speed, a lot of weapons, but almost no armor, uh, was proven as a total fallacy in Jutland, and it was proven by the blowing up of three of them and almost four of them, because uh, HMS Lion came very close to blow, uh, blowing up the same way uh, Queen Mary, Indefatigable and Invisible did. It was only saved by in the last second by a uh, flooding of a, of a magazine. So the first thing Jutland proved was that. The second thing was that, well, the Yermans were in a better tactical situation. The Royal Navy had to cross the whole North Sea in order to engage the German Navy. The German Navy was closer to the bases and that was pivotal in not losing more ships. 
because some German uh, warships were very close to founder in the way back to port, especially satellites, which was barely, barely able to make it into port days after the battle. The, the situation was so hopeless, it was actually sailing backwards because uh, the, the bows were so low in the, in the water. It actually was able to cross the sandbar of the entry of Wilmeshaven uh, port in the high tide because otherwise he couldn't. <laughs> um, Saitlitz, had it been a British warship, it would have been sunk at sea while trying to return port, for instance. And then there's another thing, is that the British cells were faulty. And, uh, well, a lot has been written about that, but just let's mention that uh, the British um, big caliber ammunition shattered uh, upon contact with uh, strong armor at high obliquity angles. Which uh, ended up happening that uh, is that a lot of uh, hits from the Royal Navy warships on the German ships were totally ineffective because the cells themselves, themselves broke on impact. Had those cells worked fine, probably the German warships would have more German warships would have been lost. Another of the things that Jutland proved is that the German um, training standard was much better than the British particularly so at night engagements. During the night engagements uh, of the Battle of Jutland, the Germans showed as a level of seamanship and uh, ability to fight that the British simply didn't have. Also, another very important thing to mention is that uh, the tactical picture of the battle was mostly unknown for, BT, for Jellico the commanding officer of the Royal the Grand Fleet for most of the battle because of very faulty procedures of um, delivering information. Jellico for most of the battle didn't exactly know where the enemy was or what the enemy was composed of. Particularly so during the night battles, um, British units were crossing the main German battle line with all the big battleships. Yet the admiral of the fleet of the British Navy didn't know that was happening until the battle was over. I mean, it's one of the things you, you, you get to think is that if you are fighting enemy battleships, you better tell your admiral. Well, actually, that didn't happen. Because of gross incompetence in some cases, because of technical problems in some other cases, and because the British simply weren't ready for a night engagement to begin with. So that battle pointed a lot of faults in the way the Royal Navy was being handled. And actually that battle uh, was very useful for the British because afterwards all those things were changed. And actually for World War II standards, uh, one of the best trained uh, fleets of the, wo of the world was the British Navy. They had very good uh, operational practices in what regards to information and um, signal reports. And uh, obviously, World War II was 30, 25 years, late, years later. Obviously, the technology was much better, so radio in World War II was much more reliable than in World War One. Wireless in Jutland proved itself to be still a very, very unreliable uh, at the moment to being used as the main um, way of uh, carrying information. Wireless signals a lot of times were misread, didn't really go through, didn't really work, because again, wireless was pretty new for World War One standards. Obviously, there was another big lesson, and that's that the ranges, or the engagement ranges, were very long, uh, way longer than expected. And that armor layouts, which were being used by then, with quite thin decks, were totally incapable of dealing with that kind of warfare because of plugging fire. This is one of the most know known things and results of Jutland. Everyone knows that after Jutland, uh, navies started paying a lot more attention to deck armor. But still, it's a very important point to mention. 
But probably the most important lesson of Uterland was uh, the battle cruiser lesson. Ships can't rely on speed to avoid being destroyed. If you carry something as big as the battleship guns, you better be protected against guns of the same size. Jutland pretty much ended up with the British conception of the battle cruiser, HMS Hood, which was being built by just started actually, it had been laid down just days before Jutland, was immediately stopped, redesigned and uh, um, rebuilt alongside uh, the lines of a fast battleship. The first uh, post-World War I battle cruiser designed by the British, which was the G3 class, had battleship armor, battleship guns and um, battle cruiser speed. was a fast battleship, not a battle cruiser. <clears throat> Other navies took very good notice of what happened at Utland. Actually, the battle cruiser as such got a very bad rep out of that battle, which was kind of undeserved because what's what that battle show, shows is that a ship, again, with big guns, needs a lot of protection. But there were battleships and battle cruisers with very good protection, the German ones, for instance. The Japanese good took notice of this, for instance, and their uh, Amagi class battle cruisers were very well protected. Not up to part with battleships, but still they carried very meaningful protection. The only ones, <laughs> actually, the only Navy that didn't really take that uh, memo <laughs> was the United States Navy, because the Lexington class battle cruiser, which was assigned in the, um, the 20s, was actually awfully protected. Was a tinkler in every sense of the word. Was a disaster of a of a design. Thankfully, never saw the light of day. At least not in battle cruiser form. They were changed into carriers, and they were very good carriers at that. In fact, there are a lot of um, lessons which were learned from Jutland. Not only those, but those were the most important. But probably the most important things that Jutland proved was the fullness and the foolishness of a big arms race, because in history of mankind. Every time two nations have embarked themselves in an armed race, it has almost always ended the same way. One of the nations loses the race in a war, and after the war that nation is utterly destroyed. It happened with the Persians versus Alexander, it happened to Carthage versus Rome, um, Carthage was totally destroy, destroyed after the Third Punic War. It happened uh, many times during the history of warfare and happened again in World War One. Germany started a naval race with the British. Germany got into a war versus the British. Germany wo lost that war and Germany was blasted into oblivion because of that war. That thought was one of the main reasons why the Naval Washington Conference of the 1920s happened. That was the main reason why the Society of Nations was founded. That was the Society of Nation, Nations was the precursor of the UN, by the way. That was why um, the post-war uh, era had a feeling of not anymore in what regards to armed races, because as soon as World War One ended, several nations became embarked into massive naval armed races. The US entered a massive naval construction program, the Japanese followed suit with a massive naval construction program which honestly would have bankrupted that nation, and the British had to follow suit because the British again relied on the Royal Navy to support her status of uh, global power. And uh, after a few years it was plain to see for everyone that the same mistakes of before World War I were being repeated again, and that what had led to Jutland and what had led to World War I was being repeated once again. And uh, the leaders of the world decided that that wasn't a wise thing to do. And that was the reason why the Washington Naval Conference happened. And that's why the Washington Naval Treaty happened.
and that's why the naval regulations that defined World War II navies happened. World War II navies were pretty much designed because of and along the line, alongside the lines of the Washington and London Naval Treaties. And the Washington and London Naval Treaties have a lot to do with the fact that Jutland had happened. But that was a far-reaching consequence. Short term, the consequences were different. Strategically, strategically speaking, again, Jutland was a British victory. Even while they lost more ships, even while they lost more sailors, even while the British public was totally, totally enraged by the way they didn't win a tactical victory in Jutland, and that they had lost more staff and lives than the Germans, the fact remains that the German won, Germans won a tactical victory, but not a strategic one. The North Sea was still a British lake. The Germans still couldn't receive mercant shipping. The German fleet was still unable to face the British Navy. And that was the most important consequence. Because after all the victory yells and all the iron crosses and all the um, blue maxes and all the promotions that happened after Jutland, the German Navy found itself in exactly the same position that they were before uh, Jutland had started. They were simply unable to face the British. So for the remainder of the war, the German Navy, which was pretty much the reason World War I happened, pretty much the reason why the British were fighting against the Germans, was totally, totally worthless. They rarely sailed out of their port again. They did a couple of sorties, but pretty much meaningless. And um, it was a realization uh, for the Germans and especially so the German high command of the fact that Germany couldn't be win a war at sea, which was something that was open to debate before uh, Jutland. But afterwards, it was not a question anymore. The British were outproducing the uh, Germans and in fact, Shortly after Jutland happened, the British Navy um, started receiving new ships and uh, the correlation of forces became even more lopsided against the Germans. So the Germans recognized and acknowledged the fact that the surface fleet was unable to win a war. So they turned again to something they had tried before, the submarine. Jutland was the main catalyst of the second big submarine offensive of the war, the one that brought Britain down to its knees and almost caused Britain to lose the war. After the Jutland uh, battle, all caution was thrown into the wind and the German submarines were deployed with orders to destroy enemy, ship uh, enemy mercant shipping at sight. And uh, that was the real reason alongside other things like the Zimmerman telegram, which I will speak about in another video. The real reason why the United States, the States uh, joined the war in World War I wasn't the Lusitania. Lusitania caused a very big backlash against Germany in the United States. It pretty much guaranteed that the United States, if it was to join the war, it, war, it would never be on the German side. It caused an ultimatum from Washington to Berlin, uh, calling them to stop the submarine offensive. But Lusita the loss of Lusitania didn't cause the entry of uh, the United States into the war. The United States entered into the war because of the Zimmerman telegram, again, I will touch that in another video, but particularly so because after Jutland, the Germans re restarted their submarine offensive, and obviously the Americans didn't like that a single bit, and they ended up joining the war. So Jutland, in a way, ensured that the United States on the long, uh, States on the long term would be a belligerent side in World War I, because the only way out for the German Navy to be useful for the German war effort was to use the submarine, and using the submarine meant the United States would declare war. 
So the consequences of Jutland were pretty much devastating for the Germans. The actual existence of Jutland as a ball was a devastating thing for the Germans. Again, Jutland on itself proved how awful the German leadership had been in the decades before, because they, it had forced first a traditional ally to become an enemy, the United Kingdom, and in the end caused um, well, the biggest uh, industrial power of the world, which was the United States, to declare war on Germany. Jutland was the sum of all the stupidities of, uh, that caused World War I in the first instance put into a single battle, in fact. And it was a pivotal point in naval warfare, it was a pivotal point in technology development for warships, it was a pivotal point in strategic thinking from the naval point of view and also from the international point of view. Because um, as much as after World War II everyone acknowledged that the Queen of the Seas was no longer the battleship, after World War I everyone acknowledged that the Queen of the Seas still was the battleship which before the war was very much a doubt. Before the war there were schools of thought that said that the new um, most important warship was the submarine and uh, that the torpedo would end with the supremacy of the capital ship at sea. Jutland pretty much showed that the Queen of the Sea was still and was still going to be for 30 more years the battle ship. So this has been a pretty fast and uh, not that thorough of, uh, not that in-depth, but pretty much along the lines, I mean on the surface, analysis of Jutland. What caused it? What consequences did it have? Um, what, which were the reasons why Jutland happened the way it, it did? Which were the reasons why Jutland um, was won by the Germans by, but lost by the Germans as well. And which were the main reasons why everything happened the way it did and how that battle affected the afterwards events. I really hope you enjoyed this and I really hope you learned something. But let's not forget, 100 years ago, thousands of lives were lost in the North Sea. Regardless of the reasons why that battle took place in the first instance, let's not forget and let's always remember the bravery and the service of those who lost their, life, their lives in defense of their own um, nation and their own homeland during that day. Because beyond wrongs and rights, um, I think Respect is due to those who lost their lives in the conflict. As always, I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you very much for watching and see you later.